Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for being here. It's been a very busy day. We've been here since the very morning, and we are all looking forward to the networking event, I suppose. So I'm uh, very grateful that you still take the time and energy to show up here and listen to what I have to say. And I'm very glad to be here in Bucharest, not only because it's my first time in Romania, but also because I see like uh, these many people, we've heard in the, in the morning in the opening session that uh, 1,100 people were signed up or confirmed to be attending this conference, and it's probably even more people uh, by now. And it's a security conference, and yet I see so many people with their, with their Apple hardware or running Windows and running around with their iPhones and Android devices, and all of them are talking about security nonetheless. And I am... Um, here to present GNOME, or to represent GNOME, and to talk about GNOME. And GNOME is a free software project, and I think, I deeply believe that free software and security go hand in hand, and that you cannot, well, have so much trust in your computing if you do not control your computing, and you only can control your computing if the software you're using is free. And, uh, well, you don't have that when you're running your Apple stuff. So I'm very, very happy to have the opportunity to talk here about free software. And I also have the, I'm also lucky to be here because I've noticed in the schedule that roughly 40% of the talks are being held by sponsors. And this is, I'm, I mean, GNOME is not sponsoring these events, so this is one of the few talks which are not sponsored. So I'm, I will uh, talk about GNOME or GNOME things. And one of the things that is driving us in the GNOME project recently is uh, to combine security with the functionality and usability aspects that are very important to the GNOME project at large. So we imagine to live in a triangle with, uh, with the three corners being functionality, security, and usability, and we have to somehow find the best, uh, well, position in this triangle. And I'm here today to present on how we think or how, what potential approaches are to find a sweet spot in this triangle. And I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, you consider, well, looking at GNOME, running, and running GNOME, or even contributing uh, code or, or other, uh, other things of your valuable time to the GNOME project. So let me uh, quickly ask you what you think is GNOME. Who who has heard of GNOME before? Oh, quite a few. I'm surprised. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. All of you are probably not the Apple guys that I was, uh, was shouting at earlier. <laughs> I'm sorry to have offended you. <laughs> okay. So um, all of you know GNOME, almost all of you. So um, let me ask uh, any one of you what, you, what do you think is GNOME? Maybe you in the front. I mean, sitting in the front is, uh, I mean, a perfect position for being, being put on the spot. So what do you think is GNOME? I'll repeat. GNOME is a desktop environment. Any other opinions? Any other ideas what GNOME or the GNOME project is? An operating system. Interesting, yes. At least, well, it's uh, going that way. GNOME itself, let's talk about that during the networking event. It's a compli complicated matter. Any other opinion on what GNOME is? Can anybody do the Jeopardy music? Do, 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 do. <laughs> Almost. There was, uh, someone said something about here. Say it again. Explorer. All right. You probably refer to the to the fact of managing your files, or I I make it more broadly to work with your computer. That's uh, that's true. And this also uh, I see it similarly to the operating system. GNOME tries to be a complete suite of computing or of applications, say that enable you to get your things done. So GNOME is a uh, that is it's all. Well, well, what you have said is perfectly true. It's uh, uh, very well done. It's a, it's a desktop environment first and foremost. That is when you start your computer, the things you can click on and the things you see, all of this is GNOME. GNOME is a set of applications that hopefully allow you to do your day-to-day -day computing. That includes file management. That includes browsing the web. Yes, GNOME has, uh, has its own web browser. That includes uh, other productivity applications that you will probably use, or that you probably need to use when you use your computer. GNOME is also a platform for your project if you want to develop free software. 
then you might want to consider running or having your project hosted by GNOME. GNOME, has, GNOME is running infrastructure like a bug tracker wiki and this uh, type of sort of a convenience that you might want to use when you're running a free software project. GNOME is also a set of libraries. If you're, com if you're developing a product, you may want to use the GNOME libraries for your program because the GNOME libraries have been around for a couple of decades by now and they have been tested in the wild by mil in, in millions of installations and there's many products uh, actually shipping GNOME libraries and you might as well consider using those libraries. So yes, we all have a very good idea of what GNOME is. That's very cool. So let's, uh, let me quickly um, tell you what I think the philosophy behind GNOME or the GNOME applications is. GNOME tries very hard to uh, be very usable. What, what does that mean? We mean by being usable that we try to enable as many people as possible to do their computing with GNOME. So what does that mean? That means that we try very hard to be accessible to those people or to, to as many people as possible, even to those who have, say, impaired vision or to, have, uh, which, uh, or to people which have other sort of uh, uh, problems using the computer in traditional ways. So we try very hard to go the, to go the extra mile to be accessible to those people uh, or to, to as many people as possible to enable them to do their computing with free software, with our free software. We not only try to be usable in the sense that many people can use our software, we also try to make it as pleasant as possible. Now this is probably not a surprise. Everybody would say that they try to do that, right? I mean, you wouldn't find a, a software project which, which says, well, we're trying to be very, very obnoxious to use and we try to make people hate us. So what that really means is that we believe that, you're, that, that the users are not sitting in front of their computers because they like, sitting in, because they like to sit in front of their computers. People sit in front of their computers because they need to get tasks done. They need to do actual work with their computers. And sitting in front of this machine is not something they actively, they're actively looking forward to. It's something, well, they just have to do in order to get their, their work done. So we're trying to design the whole experience around that idea of not getting into the way of obstructing the user's workflow. We're trying to make workflows as nice and as discoverable as possible so that you can actually get your work done. And this, should, this theme should follow us when we discuss uh, ideas about or related to security, which I will present uh, in the, over the course of this presentation. Oh, and I've, I actually have to, to hurry up a little. I've realized that I've only got like half an hour, and usually I'm talking for about an hour, so I have to speak quickly as, or as, as twice as fast as I, as I should do, or as I normally do. <clears throat> so, um, what this actually means, or in, in terms of more, more concrete results of the GNOME project, is that we are trying to localize everything as much as possible. That means that we are translating our software in many, many languages. I've forgotten the exact number, but you can look it up on this, uh, on this website, l10n.gnome.org, and you see uh, the, the number of languages that the GNOME software has been translated into. And Romanian is also on, in this list, and it's... Uh, it's not as good as it could be, but it's still fairly, fairly good to, uh, translation rate. So if you happen to have some spare time or if you want to contribute back to GNOME, you can consider uh, joining the translation teams and translating GNOME software. Another big thing GNOME stands for is freedom. Does anybody know what GNOME actually stands for? GNOME is an, uh, an abbreviation, right? Does anybody know what, it, what the... Uh, actual letters stand for, anybody? Anybody pulling up Wikipedia? Okay, let me tell you. GNOME stands for GNU Network Object Model Environment, with the G, the GNU, being GNU's not Unix, the free software movement. So it's the first letter, so our top priority is freedom, is the freedom uh, of, uh, is, is the free computing, putting the freedom into our users' hands. So we are, we are delivering free software. Most of this stuff is GPL, GPL2. Uh, the libraries are LGPL. So that ensures that the freedom remains with you. But that freedom, or freedom in general, also means 
that we care about you doing your computing freely, free of fear. Free of fear of someone, for example, wiretapping your communication or your, your network connection or fear of someone exploiting your machine while you're away. We are trying to free you from, from those fears because, well, if you have to be afraid of doing your computing, then you're not free. So we're, we're trying to protect you. We're trying to in increase the security, and we're trying to, well, still maintain a level of usability. The most secure system is probably one which has the battery like uh, ripped off, right? Which uh, where no uh, electricity is flowing through the motherboard and all, because uh, then you can't exploit it because it's not running at all. This, of course, would not help anybody because we still need to do computing. So we need to find a level of an acceptable level of security which does not compromise on the usability aspect. So we we are trying to release or to to. Uh, uh, make you as free as possible, and we've actually run a campaign a couple of months ago to, uh, well, to collect some money from uh, donors for increasing, hmm, say, the security and privacy of the GNOME desktop or the GNOME software. And I think the GNOME project is in a very good position to do that because when it comes to security, the when it comes to security, I think removing extraneous information is key. And I think GNOME, the GNOME philosophy fits very well into that mindset. And Barry Schwartz is a uh, psychologist, a, an American psychologist in his 70s by now. And the basic function of consciousness, the, the main task of consciousness, is filtering out all that information that you don't need to perform your task. And I think... GNOME can do that very well, because GNOME tries to get out of your way when you're doing your computing. GNOME tries to enable you to focus on your actual task at hand, and we can apply the same concept to when it comes to security. Now, you might say, well, you're talking about freedom. Freedom equals choice. And I say, no. Freedom is not about choice. The freedom for you to run, your, uh, to run the code freely does not affect your choice. The freedom of... Or, or to do your computing freely does not affect your choice uh, of, uh, or it does not mean that you have to be able to choose whatever connection or the connection type, for example. It does not mean that you have uh, to have the option of uh, selecting each and every detail of a certain technical, technical uh, detail. So removing extraneous information is also to an extent about removing choice. And in fact, if you're talking about security systems, then we better try to make it as automated as possible. We should aim for removing the user from the equation as much as possible. Only when it's really, really necessary involve the user. And especially, we must not uh, run prompts. Prompts are these dialogues, right? You probably all know them. Do you want to continue, yes or no? And imagine what happens if you ask a user who's in the middle of performing a task whether the user wants to continue. Of course the user wants to continue because he's just started performing a task. Why would the user not want to continue? So this is a, a very questionable, prompts are a very questionable implementation, choice of implementation. And we must avoid prompts if at all possible. Security prompts are just wrong. If we prompt the user for, for a security decision, that's, well, we better run, we, we better roll a dice. We, pro we have better chances of making a, making, making a better decision when we roll a dice rather than asking the user. Studies have shown that users are not able to make an informed decision when they're asked by the system, especially when doing a task. So we better roll a dice or throw a coin. Even worse, if the prompt is asking for a permanent decision. So if there's this tick box, you all know this, right? Do you want to remember this decision, yes, no? This is just plain evil, we must not do that. And I hope that if you're implementing software, if you're implementing security software, that you do not 
prompt the user, especially not prompt them, prompt them for a security decision, for a permanent security decision. So let me give you an example of what I mean. I mean dialogues like this. This connection is untrusted. Would you like to continue anyway? And I, I like to imagine my father sitting in front of his computer, just having opened his chat application, and then being like, uh, prompted by this dialogue. My father wouldn't even know what it means that the connection is untrusted. And in fact, it's not trivial. You might think, oh, well, untrusted, it's a, it's a very clear definition. I tell you, it's not. You can uh, try to read up what it means in the context of TLS in this example, if, uh, or whether the connection is trusted or not. It's a complicated, even on a technical level, a, a complicated matter, and I don't trust my father to make this, in, this, this decision uh, in an informed matter. So we must not do that, and especially we must not hide the permanent uh, effect of this dialogue with this tick box. So please do not do that. Another example is this. So uh, this is a um, software installation something, and it says, this software is not signed by a trusted provider. Do not update this package unless you're sure it is safe to do so. And again, I imagine my father trying to install software and being prompted with, with that dialogue. And to us, it's probably clear that something's fishy going on. Okay, we are technical users. We, we probably can translate these words into something meaningful in our world and make an informed decision. But the vast majority, at least the users that, that uh, the vast majority of users, at least the users that we're targeting, cannot make this decision in an informed manner. And what does it, it, it doesn't even make sense in the world of people like my father to have a, they, they haven't even thought of a trusted software provider. It, 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 these words, they don't, they just don't fit into anything they know because uh, all they want to do is run this, this uh, application. So we must not do these things. And this is my favorite. I admit it's a bit old. It's a, it's a couple of years old by now, but it's so good that I've just left it in because it, it demonstrates nicely what we are after. So this said, uh, Albert found a new update which fixes your problem. Ignore the, the English spelling mistakes here. Uh, before submitting the bug, uh, please run pkcon update dash dash repo dash enable equals sudara dash dash repo dash repo. And you should run, so this prompt is asking the user to perform or to run this in a terminal. And again, I imagine my father sitting in front of this dialogue and uh, well, not knowing whether to click yes or no or what to do at all. And if we want to, if we want to prevent or to protect people from things like mass surveillance, then we need to make this go away. If we want to protect the average, the average user from everyday threats, then we need to get rid of these. We're not necessarily talking about targeted attacks. And we are also not, we in GNOME, we are not trying to protect you from a targeted attack by, say, a state actor. But we are trying to protect as many users as possible from as many threats as possible without compromising much on the usability. And I think these things we can get rid of easily, and we should. And you should not implement such dialogues if you can avoid it. Because if you're having a security system, your user base declines by half for every keystroke or click required. Now imagine what this, what this means. If you have to type this command, I haven't counted the characters, but this is the, that was 20 characters or something. The user base has diminished uh, like by a factor of, uh, of, of a lot uh, because you have to type so many characters. So we must try to make things as automated as possible. We must try to make an informed decision ourselves, ideally allowing the user to still circumvent our, the decision that the system made, but not with prompts, but with other ways. You might very well ask, well, how do you do that? And I can tell you there's, that there are ways to allow the user to force a, not, a different decision uh, than, this, than the system has made already without prompting the user. And we at GNOME, we try to provide these things. And so should you if you're writing security software. So with that in mind, let me ask you what this is. Does anybody know what is happening here? I see a few hands. Let me 
Thank you in the back. Yes, you. It's a crypto party. So what are these people doing? They are signing their keys. So what are they doing right there? They're exchanging fingerprints. So what does that exactly mean? What are they doing? They're exchanging paper. And what is written on this paper? The fingerprint of this key. You mean this? So this is base 16 encoded data. This is uh, 160 bits of information. Let me ask you, what is the least efficient way to transmit data from like my mouth to your ear? The least efficient way. What, what, you, what can you think of uh, how to transmit data uh, in, in what ways? And what is the least efficient of those ways? Binary, base two. So if I wanted to transmit 160 bits of data, I could tell you 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. But that'd be stupid, right? So what's the second least efficient way to do that? Anybody got an idea what, what's the second least efficient way of doing that is? Say it again? Morse code. <laughs> Not too bad. It, right, it, it would probably be true. I was, uh, let, let me tell you, it would probably be bytes. Morse code would probably be the second least efficient way. But bytes, like base eight, I mean, sorry, base eight. Uh, I could tell you uh, from one to eight, to eight, right? And this would be one byte. And I would uh, do that uh, as many times as I would have 160 bits. But then, right after that, probably the third least efficient way is base 16. So we're asking these people, like, I, I scroll back. So these are 100, no, I think 211 people or something were registered for that key signing party. And 211 people are exchanging 160 bits of information each. And they're doing that in the third least efficient way possible. And they're doing that for years. This is the way how people do that for 20, 30 years by now. And again, I imagine my father trying to do secure email with exchanging open PGP keys. And this, you can't see that right now. It was a good year. I think it was uh, two, three years ago. The weather was not too bad. But I was at, this is Fosdem, by the way, the biggest uh, free software convention in Europe. Five to 6,000 people. And this is in winter. This is uh, the last January weekend. So it's usually cold. It's usually, usually it's snowing. And it's like minus two, minus five degrees. And people are outside exchanging 160 bits of information in the third least efficient way for two to three hours. Of course, you get a cold and get sick when you can't get back. But at least you can do secure email, except for my father. So, and there's lots of other problems with that too, right? I mean, not, not, not being able to, to uh, tell B and 8 apart is just one of them. And we could imagine so many better ways of doing that. So um, once you've exchanged your, the fingerprint, what do you do with the, with the exchange fingerprint? You download the key from a key server, oh Jesus. Uh, okay, you do, and then, then you've downloaded the key, and then what? Right, you check the fingerprint of the downloaded key, and then you do what? Right, then you decide how much uh, trust you put in this key, and then you do what? Right, eventually you want to sign to actually produce a signature on that key. And the way to do that, the, the state of the art, the, the pinnacle of key signing is CAF. CAF is a piece of software, it's a good piece of software, I really like it. And it's, uh, I mean, you, you can't say anything bad about CAF, except that in order to configure it, you need to write raw Perl. This is the CAF configuration, the configuration of that software that you need to sign another person's key. And imagine my father wanting to write me a, a secure email. My father has to learn Perl first in order to configure a software in order to sign my key. And it's 2016. I don't think it should be that hard, should it? We shouldn't make it that hard for people to sign other people's key. No wonder we have this problem of mass surveillance if people cannot actually sign other people's keys in order to write secure emails. And there's, you mentioned key servers. Key servers, I, I think, are terrible. We, we should get rid of key servers. So I just, let, let me briefly mention key servers. Key servers are public infrastructure that we trust our public keys with. So we upload our keys to the key server network, and the key server makes sure that all other key servers in the network 
have the same state. And then you can go at another time to the key server and ask for a key. And the key server will hopefully give that key back to you. That doesn't sound too complicated, except in crypto, trivial things are hard to achieve and things you would think are hard are trivial in crypto. And this problem of, the, of distributing public information is much harder than you think. You might not want the key server to, for example, deny a key to you. If I'm asking for the key of, say, contact at amnestyinternational.com or whatever, or .org probably, uh, then I don't want the key server to be able to deny that key to me. I, uh, at least I want to detect that I'm being, or that the data that I will get is manipulated. And currently, I cannot do that. And I also claim that dealing with the current key server network is hard because the software running the key server network is written in OCaml. Does anybody know OCaml, the programming language? The name, yes. It's a weird programming accent uh, from the Middle Ages uh, of, in France. It, it originated in France somewhere in the 1600s or so. And I know exactly three people who know OCaml. And I think I know quite a bit of people, of programming people. I've been around the free software community for about 10 years. And I've met a few people. And three of those know OCaml. And, well, why do I say that? I say that because we're relying on this infrastructure that nobody can maintain. Oh, sorry, it's not nobody, it's three people. And it's, uh, I think we can do better than that. So, I think, or I, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody thinks that there is a big conspiracy behind all this mess, right? We're standing in like minus five degrees for three hours to exchange 160 bits of information in the third least efficient way. And we're using this OCaml based software to like, uh, to deliver keys to, to everybody. We need to write raw Perl to configure our software to, to exchange uh, keys. There must be something, there must be a bigger force behind this mess. But I don't think it's the case. I just think that these crypto people, these security people, they just had very special users in mind, themselves. And you can't blame them. I mean, in free software, we say, scratch your own itch, and people do, and that's fine. And people did with Carbon, people did with the, with the key server software, and it's good. But if I want my father to write me a, an email securely, then the current state of the art is not necessarily good or acceptable. So I think we can do better. And um, I think with the, with the stuff that we've seen previously, like automate as many things as possible, make as many security, security decisions as possible, try to be or try to not get into the way of performing a task. With these philosophies in mind, I think we can do much better. And uh, I like to rant, right? I, I like to complain a lot. And uh, I like to give out to people and I, I, I think I'm good at that. But uh, sometimes people complain back and say, well, just complaining, you know, is easy. Why don't you do stuff? And uh, sometimes I do. And this is a GNOME key sign, which is uh, a GNOME project, mainly written by uh, Andre. He's uh, here also in the room. A uh, Romanian student, by the way. Very, uh, very talented young man. And we've come up with uh, this piece of software. So instead of standing two hours or five, four hours at minus five degrees in the cold, what you would do is you would present this page to the other party, and the other party would either scan this uh, fingerprint, uh, this uh, barcode which contains the fingerprint, or the other party would type it off, just as you would today, and then it's one, it's a one-click operation to do, to do all the rest. So this is a short video demoing how this is supposed to be working. We see uh, that the key has been exchanged, and now I press next, and everything is done. Now the email uh, client pops up, and with the, with the uh, push of, uh, of the send button, everything is done. And this takes, I mean, this whole video, I think, is 45 seconds or something. So you can sign another person's key in 45 seconds. When you read the announcements for the key signing party, or these key signing parties, how, how they are called, then you will see that they ask you to have everything done 
by the end of summer or something. So they give you five months or, or four months because they know it's a tedious process. They know it takes a while for you to get all these things done to learn Perl in order to configure the software. So they give you a couple of months. Now it's a matter of a couple of seconds. And this, uh, I also claim that this is more secure than doing it traditionally because the key has been transferred locally without the internet, without having to rely on key servers which could potentially manipulate the public key. So I think this is a easier, faster, and more, well, say it's more acceptable by, by people like my father. So this is a, one area where I think uh, the philosophies can be applied very well. Let me uh, quickly, uh, geez, I want it to be done by now, but uh, let me quickly go over another uh, pet peeve of mine, which is USB secret keys. A couple of years ago, I uh, researched, I, I did a lot of research in USB security. I patched QMO to, it's a relatively long story. Let me tell you that I investigated USB security from the ground up. And I found, not so surprisingly, that USB is a relatively large attack surface. And uh, then you could very well ask yourself, do you know when you use your USB? And actually, more importantly, do you know who uses your USB when you don't? Because your computer, I mean, I, was, I left my, my machine here when I went to the toilet just half an hour ago. And my machine was here, you know, exposed to the public more or less, and there's so many, many interfaces, USB being one of them. And I claim that I don't necessarily know who uses my USB when I'm not in front of my machine. Yet, it's a relatively large attack surface. And it's not only, I mean, you could say, well, you guy, we don't know you, we don't trust you, you could say, you could tell us anything. And uh, other people also think that USB is an issue. And in fact, there has been a press about uh, USB security, especially this uh, bad USB attack, has been hyped uh, for reasons I don't really share, but uh, people should be aware that USB is an issue. So what do you do if you don't want to get exploited via your USB? One thing would be to use super glue, right? And just uh, sort of uh, fill the USB slots with glue, and then, uh, well, you can be sure that nobody will ever exploit your USB. By Apple, right. Then you're absolutely secure also because you can't run anything anyway. <laughs> At least one. <laughs> so um, this, of course, is not an acceptable solution. Neither the glue nor the Apple. So let me propose that we disable USB. And now, uh, like via software, sorry. I mean, uh, software, let, let us disable USB via software. And what we see now? is uh, a very small program, also written by a Romanian uh, a student who was uh, participating in GNOME Summer of Code uh, two years ago, I think. Uh, George, he's not here, I think, but he's also a very tal talented young man, and I'm happy to have worked with him. And he's implemented USB blocking. So what you see here is that this program, it turned off USB. And you see the first line, does it work? It works. So here you see uh, ha there has a uh, USB pen drive being plugged in, and uh, the program said, well, I don't know it, let's block it. And there was also a second device, I think it was a, like a presenter like this one, and it also said, well, I don't know it, let's block it. Now you might say, well, this is not useful. I mean, I want to use USB, right? I have these ports. I could equally have filled it up with, uh, with glue, but uh, I still want to use some functionality of the USB at least. And then we say, okay, then let's allow pen drives. So what we see now is that pen drives are being allowed, and uh, we have plugged in the, uh, the pen drive, and we see the pen drive is popping up here. The other device, on the other hand, this uh, sort of input device, is not allowed, so we block it. So this, this alone allows you to restrict the number or the types of devices that you can plug into your machine via a relatively simple mechanism. If you know that you're never gonna input or plug in a, say, camera, you could do it now. And this is already quite, 
quite powerful if you, if you really want it. But now you might say, well, I, I mean, this is how many characters, say 30 characters. We have learned that the more people have to type or click, the less uh, people will use it. So I say, well, then let's combine this functionality with the rest of the operating system, with the rest of the shell. And this is now very, uh, I'm a bit sorry for this, uh, this video. We, uh, we see there's a tiny lock in the, in the top. And this lock was open, like uh, we, we've just seen it being open, and the pen drive being, being plugged in, we have seen the, uh, the uh, pen drive popping up there. And then the lock has been closed, the pen drive has been uh, replugged, and nothing has, uh, has popped up. I mean, you have to believe me that the pen drive was indeed plugged in and that nothing popped up. I mean, there was no, no fake. And of course, this is, uh, this is only prototypical. The real thing would need to be implemented into the shell properly without this block clicky thing, but rather when the, say, machine is locked. Because when the machine is locked, when I'm on the toilet, I lock my machine, and there's no way I could possibly plug a USB device in because I'm not there. So ideally, the system would disable USB when the screen is locked, or at least some parts of USB. I probably want to plug in keyboards and mice uh, in any case, even when the screen is locked, because the keyboard might just break and I need to put in, plug in a replacement. And there's many other corner cases like that that you need to think of when finally implementing this sort of functionality. But the point is, is here the point is not to show a like fully fledged system, but to tell you what we are after, like or what the GNOME project is after and what the ideas are and what the philosophies behind the solutions are that we, that we are looking for. So um, with that, I have exactly five minutes uh, left for questions, and I encourage you to ask as many questions as you can and like, and I thank you for your attention. Questions, please, or awkward silence. Please wait for the microphone there in the back. So uh, there is a tendency in uh, user interface so that uh, uh, buttons for confirmation would uh, be no longer necessary. For example, you have a configuration uh, page where uh, you set things and uh, then you close the window and uh, uh, everything uh, just uh, is saved automatically. Uh, how do you see this in the context where the user does not want to decide what uh, what to, to set right then and uh, there. So uh, he doesn't want to be bothered with, uh, with setting the other things. So maybe he made a change and uh, uh, just forgot what uh, changes uh, he made and wants, uh, wants to abort uh, the settings. Without a cancel button, uh, uh, he cannot do this. Uh, I think uh, I know what you're referring to. The GNOME, the core GNOME design mandates that changes are effective immediately. That there's no need to first make the setting and then to confirm that you've just made the setting. This is an anti-pattern that is not present in GNOME. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yes. And now um, your question is how would they, how would we deal with a user that wants to undo the setting without knowing that the user has done the setting? Yes, uh, basically how can he decide not to decide then what settings to right. do? So the, my answer would be to not offer the setting in the first place. If it's an obvious choice, then the system has just to make it. And if there is a configuration option, it shouldn't be in the main interface, but rather as a separate sort of interface in a peripheral interface. So the, what many GNOME programs have is core sort of settings for the application at hand. Think your font for the editor, or the font size for the editor is, uh, you can configure that, or the better example is uh, line, uh, highlighting the line where you're adding your editor, or displaying numbers uh, on the side uh, on, of your editor. This is a core setting. You, you have that straight in the editor itself. And changing this 
is effective immediately. If you change uh, that, that tick box, the effect, you will notice the effect immediately, which is a design pattern. It's being actively sought that, the, that this should behave that way. More sort of internal settings have to be made out of band via, say, GNOME Tweak Tool. GNOME Tweak Tool allows you to change many more, say, core settings that affect the system at, at large or, or at, uh, at a deeper level than the core application thing. And I think this might relate to what you're after, that there's a core per app sort of application-wide thing, and then the more deeper settings are have to be made out of band in a separate, very separate thing, that the user is not tempted to sort of screw up the system. Yes, so this is what I'm uh, referring to. So right. I'm just and I have a, that... sorry, sorry to interrupt, just, just very quick. I, my, I have a, an anecdote, again, my father, uh, where I, at one stage, the system was broken, because back in the day, you could change the font very easily, the font size. Turned out that my father has changed the font size to 150 or something by accident, not necessarily knowing what he was doing. But there was an interface, right? And people click on things because that's what buttons are for. So he clicked on things. Eventually, the font size was 150. Not a single letter could be seen on, on the page. And even worse, you could not reset everything because widgets were so large, you could not even resize the whole thing to, to reset the setting. So this is, uh, I mean, we probably know that we should not, you know, set the font size to 150 because it makes everything not legible. But, I mean, people do, and then people are screwed up. And now you can say, well, if people do that, then they're, I mean, it's their fault. But I say, no, if the system allows you to do stupid things, then it's not a good system. We should really try to make a system discoverable and usable by as many people as possible, including people like my father. If you do want, nonetheless, to set the font size to 150, you should still be able to, but not via the core app. You might still you know, edit your configuration via terminal maybe, maybe via editor, and manually set the configuration if you really desire. So we should not hard code things, but we should not make them discoverable and exposed to the user. Sorry to have interrupted you. I really wanted to get that sort of done. Anything else? Please, hit me. Here in front. Hi. So uh, uh, when the problem, when you are in, a, for example, in a browser and you open your editor and just turn on to the browser and editor just uh, slowly loads and you lose the focus, will this will be fixed in Linux world anytime soon? I, I'm afraid I'm not sure what you're referring to. I. Haven't, I, I use editors and browsers a lot. In fact, uh, my, my desktop is browser windows, like 30 or so. I have editor windows, probably 10, and terminals, maybe 15. This is pretty much all I have. Today, the LibreOffice is, uh, is an exception. Usually, I have 50 windows in this uh, proportion okay. of things. And I've never realized You that. work in the terminal, you open LibreOffice, uh -huh. you just uh, right away switch the terminal, and LibreOffice opens slowly. And the focus is on LibreOffice, not in, anymore on the terminal. So you're just typing and you'll see. You ah, uh, OK, that, that sounds like a bug. I mean, that shouldn't be the case, right? I mean, you should yes, be, but it's you shouldn't get distracted the, from, your, from, your, from the thing that you're doing right now, even if the application has loaded that you've started three minutes ago. Yes, but it's not regarding one application. It's all of them do behave this way. Oh, really? It sounds like a bug. Maybe we should have a look into that. Anything else, please? Ah, I love that. Maybe the, the colleagues uh, here, you was referring to focus uh, stealing. So uh, this is common in other uh, uh, desktop environments as well. So <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, only problem. Okay, that said, we, uh, as is common with free software, we always need people hacking on things. So, uh, if you happen to find a solution, please share your like results, or if, especially if it's code, then release it under free software and share it. 
Anything else? This, oh, in the back, please. Um, hi, what do you think of Keybase as a solution for key sharing? Right, so Keybase is funny because they use several key or identity anchors like Facebook and Twitter and I don't know, LinkedIn maybe. And I don't use any of that. I mean, I have no relation to, to any of those uh, whatsoever, except for GitHub. I think they also do GitHub, and uh, this well, is probably what I could do. So I'm personally not affected by Keybase because I'm not using any of these others, uh, any of the, uh, these other identity providers. But I think it's good. I mean, if people trust the system enough to share keys, then please. I mean, it only helps. I, I don't think it cannot help the popularity of OpenPGP, especially because the population of OpenPGP users is like tiny. The strong set of, uh, of keys in the OpenPGP key server network is like 50,000 or so. And I mean, this is the number of people that Facebook gets probably every hour, you know. And so it's not, I'm not, I'm not actively using it myself, but I'm happy if other people do. And yes, please uh, start using OpenPGP and uh, start, uh, uh, start to do your emails uh, more securely. That's of course hard when you do Gmail and, uh, I don't know, uh, use uh, proprietary platforms, but uh, you could at least give it a try. Uh, speaking of Gmail, what about Mailvelope? Does it still exist? Hmm? Does it still exist? Yeah, it still exists. Oh, cool. I, I wish them all the success there is. I, I again, I don't know uh, much of Mailvelope. I only know that uh, with the Snowden revelations, many projects have started, and quite a few of them have already well been buried. I just recently I learned that Whiteout, German like German privacy preserving email provider, shut down in December last year. I was sorry to hear that. And I hope that Mavelop uh, will, will be a success. I really do. Um, also about the USB thing, where uh -huh. you said you block storage devices. Yeah, no, the other way around. We, it doesn't matter, but we allowed it. In this example, we allowed oh, okay. USB devices. Um, but if you allow human interface devices, uh -huh. those are dangerous as well. Think of the USB rubber ducky. Ah, yes, I'm thinking of that. So, so what are you thinking of this attack? How, how is it dangerous? If the computer is unlocked, Right. Then it types things uh, into... Exactly. Right. It probably doesn't do that, though, when the screen is locked, right? Sorry? It, it probably doesn't do that successfully if the screen is locked, though. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. The, these devices have a certain risk to them also. But I'm very happy if we can limit the attack surface by a very large amount without compromising much on the functionality of the whole system. And with USB, you can load pretty much any driver that you have on your system, any, any uh, hardware driver that you have on your system. And if we can limit that to only human input devices, then I'm more than happy, because then we've cut off, I, I, I don't know, I'm making up a number, uh, we've cut off 95% of, uh, of the code that we could potentially load with USB. Because when we only allow human interface devices, then the kernel will not load any, any other driver, and then uh, the attack surface has been reduced by, by a large, large amount, by a large fraction. But yes, you're absolutely right, and this is uh, probably one of the reasons why none of this has been made production ready yet, because these, let me call them policies, how to deal with devices, is not trivial. You have to, to think, and you have to think hard, and you need to run actual tests to well, come up with a policy and validate your policy. Thank you. You're most welcome. Okay, last question. Who dares to ask the last question? Three, two, one. Gone, thank you very much.